Okay, good. So let's start. My name is John Bell, the director of the Ballard Institute and Museum of Puppetry. And I'm here with Terry Silvio uh, for our summer online puppet forum number eight on July 23rd. Uh, we're recording this at um, eight o'clock, eight o'clock in the morning in uh, Boston area where I am and eight o'clock in the evening in Taipei, Taiwan where, where Terry is. So if you're watching this at our normal uh, webcast time of uh, four o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time, uh, Terry and I won't well, we, we aren't live. I'm gonna to try to be on tap at four o'clock this afternoon to answer questions and comments. And Terry can answer questions uh, in the next couple of days if, if you're watching this uh, when, when we normally broadcast it at 4 p.m. or later on when it's uh, available online on our Facebook page and on our YouTube page. This series of online puppet forums is uh, our effort to take advantage of the COVID-19 peculiarities to talk with scholars and artists about puppetry and uh, puppetry studies, which is something that a lot of us do. And the, there's a total of 13 of these forums, uh, of which this is number eight. Uh, they'll continue in through August, and, and I'll mention some of the upcoming uh, forum guests uh, at the end of this session. Um, let's see. And we're trying to get at uh, a sense of what puppetry does and, and how puppetry connects to particular cultures and particular places. I happened to read Terry's book, uh, Puppets, Gods, and Brands, recently, and was totally fascinated by it. Uh, Terry is an associate Re research fellow at the Institute of Ethnology Academia Sinica, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, in Taipei, Taiwan. She's conducted ethnographic research in, on puppetry, animation, design, fandoms, theater, and gender and sexuality in Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, and Southeast Asia. and um, her most recent book is, is the one I just held up. And then now, uh, as I think we'll discuss, she's involved in some other interesting uh, projects as well. So welcome, Terry. It's nice to have you here. Thank you for having me. Yay. <laughs> in, uh, I think what we want to look at here, if I can get right to the the, meaty, interesting aspects of our discussion is um, the intersections, uh, for example, with, with uh, puppets, gods, and brands, the intersections of Chinese hand puppet traditions, which is maybe where a lot of us puppeteers come in, Japanese manga and anime, cosplay, religion, fan culture, and then the Peely Multimedia Company's um, globally popular Thunderbolt fantasy series. And you, in that book, you kind of uh, expertly balance an approach to all of those different media that, that are related to puppet theater. It's complicated what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's not a, a, a question I get. I'm, uh, uh, I, that's an estimation of, of what, what's interesting about your work. In, I, could, I, I could go on a little bit. Um, in your introduction to Puppets, Gods, and Brands, Theorizing the Age of Animation, you write that uh, you find yourself, uh, quote, surrounded by animated characters, virtual personalities that live within bodies made of ink and paper, wood and cloth, vinyl and metal, pixels and code, which is super an interesting array of what uh, Frank Proshin, uh, one of our next guests, um, started to call performing objects. Um, Terry, your specific subject uh, 
in, in, in puppet Scots and Francis, Taiwanese popular culture, but uh, like so many forms of culture today, that particular uh, locale in Taiwan is always connected to the rest of the globe. Uh, and worlds of puppetry, anime, cosplay, fan fiction, films, and television in Taiwan, as well as in Japan and China, and also linked to cultural realms around the world. Uh, and I, I like the way that your detailed focus on material performance in Taiwan is a way of understanding the nature of today's global culture. Do, how, do, how do you see this complex network of things that you're looking at? Yeah, that's, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess it, it just kind of grew out of my experience and just kind of noticing how much more, um, or how many more kind of non flesh and blood characters there were all around, partly, you know, logo characters appearing everywhere and um, a lot of animation used in advertising. And I mean, it's kind of happening I guess, in, in, or it was, um, <laughs> when the cinema industry was, you know, <laughs> still able to do things. Um, in the US and, and in Japan as well, that, you know, you're getting just a lot higher proportion of animated film, for instance, to live action. Um, and at first I thought, uh, because my research kind of shifted over time from, from theater, from the opera, the uh, Taiwanese opera, why to, to puppetry that, you know, it was just my own focus. Like I was, because I started working on, on puppetry, I was noticing this. Um, but I think it's not just that. I mean, I think this is a real, you know, a real change that's happened over the past few decades. Um, so yeah, I kind of was finding things out in the process of my research that I, kind of suspected would be helpful in, mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. trying to figure out what this meant. Um, mm -hmm. Because, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it, you know, the rise of animation, the animation boom usually gets seen as, um, as this kind of a byproduct, you know, of, okay. of other global changes of the, you know, the globalization of, right. of you know, the media industries and Japan kind of gaining soft power and, um, right. Digital technology allowing a lot more content to, to you know, flow across borders. Um, but, you know, I, I think it's not just a byproduct. I think mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really important kind of mm -hmm. condensation and that there's um, something that's really good to think with, you know, mm -hmm. going on there and the idea of non-human characters um, that are being animated. The part of... Uh, what's fascinating about your work is that uh, you're you're coming into this field, or you're coming into your work as an anthropologist. And it's always been interesting to me that historically anthropology has been one of the uh, strongest um, methods of looking at puppet, mask, and object performance. You know, even going back to the beginnings of anthropology in the 19th century. Uh, an anthropologists are are uh, going uh, going around, like going to the Southwest and the United States and looking at Zuni Pueblo performance and sort of uh, methodically or actually with real interest, I think, um, trying to figure out puppet masks and object performances, which is which are such important parts of like. Um, First Nations indigenous culture in the U.S. or in Asia or in Africa. Um, it's a complicated subject because, uh, as Michael Tausig talks about, you know, the, the situation of anthropology as part of a colonialist uh, uh, operation. But, but anthropology, I always think that anthropology sort of forces the anthropologists to deal with what they're looking at. In a lot of cases, it means dealing with puppets and masks and objects. It's yeah, I mean, I, th I think, um, you know, the idea of, of cultural performances came up really early in anthropology, well, not that early, I guess, but, but part of it is that that's, um, 
if you're trying to to kind of enter into a culture and understand it, um, you know, your first kind of interface is going to be performances that people do for you or invite you to see because they think, you know, this is what our culture is about. This will, okay. this is, you know, this will show you the rituals and um, and performances. Um, you know, you might get like invited to weddings because like, oh, you're interested in our culture, come to, and you know, weddings are that, that kind right. of performance as well. So, um, yeah, so I think a lot of anthropologists um, do work on performance, even if they're not anthropologists of performance. Uh-huh, um, okay. Yeah. Um, do you consider yourself an anthropologist of performance? Um, yeah. One of the things, yeah, performance, but I mean, also media and, uh -huh. and um, you know, media technologies and, and other, you know, gender and other things. But um, that's definitely where I started mm -hmm. um, and still a primary, a primary focus. So I guess like looking at performances um, as an anthropologist. Uh -huh. you know, it, yeah. I think one of the things I appreciate is as someone who's, like trying to look at the wider, wide contexts or wider contexts of, of puppet performance and seeing how puppetry is connected to things that are not normally thought of as puppetry, but more object performance, which you alluded to earlier. Um, uh, I, I, my, my sense of that personally makes me appreciate the kind, the kind of work you're, you're doing uh, with your approach to, to different types of, of, of performance. And maybe something we could get to in, in, in a little bit is your sense of performance uh, in comparison to animation. Because at some, one point in Puppets, Gods, and Brands, you talk about animation as uh, not something that supersedes the idea of performance, but as a kind of valuable way to think about the nature of performance um, today. Maybe n now is the time to talk to that or, or else we could go talk about Taiwanese opera. Uh, maybe, and let's talk yeah. about animation because we're gonna get into that. What, what's the difference between performance and animation? Okay, yeah, well, I, I think like the main, I guess if I would say like what, what kind of, um, like the focus that's kind of held my my work together that's kind of been steady across all of the different projects that I've done is that I'm really interested in kind of imagined worlds and imagined characters and then how that relates to, you know, lived experience and um, how different genres and, and different things set up different kinds of relationships um, between experience and the imagined world that you're seeing or, or entering into. So, you know, you have a very different relationship with, you know, realist theater or right. realist cinema than you do with, you know, Punch and Judy. Right? Mm -hmm. they're, um, yeah, they're, they're like, and how those, how those imagined worlds are framed in mm -hmm. such a way that, you know, it allows, it allows those performances, um, you know, or that art to have a different kind of, different possibilities for what kinds of effects it could have in terms of social change or, you know, social trans or transmission or, or whatever. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the difference of performance and animation in that way, of, of, that they kind of set up different, um, sort of different relationships between, you know, the world of the imagination and, the world of experience, um, or maybe not not entirely, not necessarily different in terms of like the distance um, or the separation, but um, kind of different in terms of like where they focus your attention, right? Uh, and um, yeah, and what kinds of actions are are highlighted as as cultural yeah. actions or you know actions where imagination and action are linked. By animation, like I, I, was, I was thinking about, oftentimes when I think of animation, I think of watching um, 
you know, uh, you know, cell animation, like basically cartoons or maybe digital animation, but more, more often I think of, you know, Studio Ghibli or something like that. But I, my, I think you're, you have a more, like a, a broader un definition of animation. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, animation, I mean, the, the like, most common definition, which I guess is, like, the, also the, what I would say is, like, the narrow definition is that it's a genre of, of cinema and television, right. right, and it's supposed to live action, so it's right. basically kind of um, anything where the illusion of, of movement and the illusion of, you know, liveness mm -hmm. or motion is mm -hmm. created in some way other than, mm -hmm. you know, bodies moving. Um, and I wanted to, to come up with a definition of animation that was specifically for anthropologists. Um, oh, okay. So that, that would be broader so that I, I took kind of performance studies as my model. Right. So that way that the definition of performance, um, got expanded from, you know, a stage performance from, you know, being equal the same thing as theater or what, right. you know, theater being what people think of um, to then you get Goffman and the performance of self in everyday life and because right. well, what people are people are performance is what people are doing in their everyday right. lives um, and then to Judith Butler where it's you know you're con constructing the self that's performing you know um, like a kind of meta version of, of, of you know beyond Goffman um, and so I kind of wanted to try and do that with um with you know puppetry or animation so that what you you think of as animation you've got that small definition but what if you use that as like mm -hmm. what are we doing in everyday life that would be animation that could be thought of right. as animation and uh, so kind of going back to the to the latin and you know that it's right investing something with life and invest or yeah. Yeah. With human characteristics yeah yeah, I think like the French French uh, term animation. Like um, I remember when we t were touring in in Europe a lot with Bread and Puppet. But an, you know, an animator is a job, which who, somebody who sort of makes things happen. And and animation is a, this. It's not about film animation, but it's about animating a community in a way. Yeah. And, I think so. Um, and I, I'm thinking of performance studies. One of the great things about performance studies is that the way you were talking about um, um, Irving Goffman uh, and performance of everyday life, I think, and, and Judith Butler's, um, that performance studies has wide ranging definitions. So that, for example, when I got into performance studies, a, a great thing for me was that puppetry was just assumed to be, oh yeah, of course, that's part of performance studies. Let's let's look at that. Um, whereas in other at other areas of theater, for example, at that time, back in a previous century, puppetry was like, well, that's not really theater, is it? You know, why would you want to think about puppetry? And uh, that was much more of a challenge to to ask theater people to think about puppetry. But with performance studies, it was like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, of course, let's think about puppetry and also mask performance and all other sorts of things. And that um, that I always thought was was uh, really useful f for us. Uh, I wonder if we should go to the to um, the images that you put together. And kind of to start out as a way of, of looking at your interest in Taiwanese opera, which was the subject of your of your dissertation. Is that yeah? Okay, here I go, attempting to share my screen. Okay, I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Um yeah. so what are we looking at here? Okay. Should I turn my I think you can, I think you could stay, whatever you want to do. Well, okay. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just be a, a disembodied voice for, for a minute. Awesome. Um, yeah, so, so I'll explain a little bit about how um, I got interested in Taiwanese opera, um, which is 
uh, Guahi in, in uh, Taiwanese Hokkien okay. language. And, um, basically, as, as an undergraduate, I'm saying I, I did a lot of theater um, and I was involved in a lot of feminist theater and we did a lot of um, work with cross-gender performance. So I played, you know, male roles a few times and uh, I was terrible at it. Um, and part of it was we, we, we really had no system, right? So, so we would just go out and try and like watch men, <laughs> you know, and we had a few principles like, you know, take up more space, men take up more space. And we would try to change our habitus um, just based on kind of observing the men around us. Um, but it didn't work that way. And, I mean, in part because the women who were playing the female roles didn't have to do that. <laughs> so we kind of got these sort of stylized acting. And I remember, you know, once after uh, one performance, I had a, a friend who said, well, I thought you were, you know, you, you were pretty good, but I never believed you were a man. I just thought it was a play about lesbians, um, uh, you know, which was fine <laughs> as, as an interpretation, I guess. Right. Um, but I had, you know, saw some some Chinese theater. I think I saw some Chinese, some Beijing opera and Peking opera, and I think I saw some Kabuki. Uh huh. You know, mostly in videos, but just um, right. You know, over the course of my studies, and um, I just got really interested in these genres of theater where cross gender performance wasn't experimental at all, where right. it was the norm and it had been around for hundreds and thousands or thousands of years. Um, and I wondered what it was like to grow up with that, mm -hmm. to have that as, as your sort of your default, that of course women on stage are played by men or men are played by women. Right. Um, and I wound up uh, going to Taiwan and being focusing on, on um, Taiwanese opera for, for um, two main reasons. One is because it was one where um, the cross gender is women playing men. So women play all of the roles um, in Taiwanese opera. They originally it was all it was all men in the during the Japanese occupation. So in until around the nineteen late nineteen teens, nineteen twenties, it was mostly an amateur form that was performed by men. Right. Um, and then in the nineteen twenties, it started to professionalize. And um, there were th that's when theaters started being built by the, the it was a Japanese colony at the time, and the Japanese right. started building you know commercial theaters which had never existed before. Uh, um, so it was moved from the Temple Festival to commercial theaters. I mean, it stayed at the Temple Festival as well. But when right. it moved into commercial theaters, um, women started playing some of the roles, hmm. and then you started getting uh, a number of all girl troops. Mm -hmm. um, you know, partly for like economic reasons and social reasons. Um, and it kind of stayed that way. So that was one reason was that I was just, you know, interested in women playing the male role. What, and what, what, what are we, not. could you explain what we're looking at here in this photo? Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You wanted to do that. <laughs> sorry. Yes. Um, so this is a, a temple festival performance of right. Taiwanese opera. So you can see kind of what, um, okay, yeah, I'll turn back on. Um, so I can, I can, you can see me too. Um, and this is actually a photograph, um, I confess I, I did not take it, but, but I've got many like it, of a ritual performance that is done before the uh, first performance at a temple festival. So usually there'll be one in the afternoon and one in the evening. Um, and the one in the afternoon usually has a little ritual performance that happens before because um, the performances are offerings to the gods. Right. Yeah. So this this is basically um, I'm, I don't know when this was taken, but this was pretty typical of what it was like in the '90s in in Taipei. Now in the cities, you're seeing less and less of this, um, but it's it's still quite typical for for what mm -hmm. a temple festival performance um, would would look like, and the costumes are. The, the most traditional kind that they, they use. So you would actually, these costumes aren't that different from what would be used in the afternoon show. And when we, when we, when we say that, that the performance is a ritual perform, performance for the gods, am I right in thinking that the content of the show is not necessarily about 
the gods, you know, like if in a Christian performance, you know, I'm thinking of medieval theater, the performances yeah. were based on the Bible. But if I, I, I'm thinking that this, the, the content, the dramaturgy of the show might itself not be religious. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, sometimes it is. Sometimes the stories are based on myths uh -huh. or folklore, um, but usually not. Um, the ones in the afternoon, they're so. Th at temple festivals, you, you have, like I said, the afternoon show and the evening show, and the afternoon show is usually a tragedy, and it's usually, or a uh -huh. kind of um, morality tale, right. kind of. Um, usually, they're called gotsehi, or stories from old books. So <laughs> it's um, usually history, or, you know, the, like the romance of the three kingdoms, right. um, or something like that. Um, so that's not religious. There is, like I said, the, the in the ritual before the show, uh, the performers do play the parts of gods. Um, okay. They sort of play the parts of these kind of low tier gods, um, kind of presenting the show to the god who's watching. So, um, so for this picture, um, from from where the the photograph is standing, if you were the photographer, you would be in front of the temple. So the um, the stage is set up facing the temple, so that the gods inside the temple can can watch it. Right. But um, but the theater itself isn't ritual, and it's not considered a ritual. It's um, it's an offering, hmm. right? So it's you know kind of has the same status vis-a-vis -vis religion that like oranges do, hmm. right? Like you offer oranges. <laughs> right. Um, you offer entertainment um, mainly because most um, most of the gods in in Chinese folk religion are you know folk Taoism are ancestors or they were somebody's ancestors who you know kind of were promoted to to being deities um, and it's pretty much assumed that even the gods that weren't originally ancestors that were kind of, kind of miraculously appeared already as gods. Um, that they all kind of have similar tastes and, and you know, lives to, to humans and that what people like, gods will like. Um, and part of it is also that temples compete kind of to create an atmosphere, what's called a real, no, uh, like a hot and noisy atmosphere because the more bustling things are and the more excitement there is in the air, um, kind of the, the, the more honor is, is goes to the gods, the, the gods like that better. But it's not, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not ritual in the way that like Greek theater is ritual. Yeah. So can I move on to the next image? And oh. then maybe we could show yeah. these three, three images and then talk a little more if, if that's okay. How do I do that? Okay. okay. What are we looking at here? And what we're looking at here, um, I wonder if we can make our images a little smaller. This is the kind of performance that at least in the 1990s um, was performed as the evening show. Uh, and it's called a, a genre called opéra, um, which supposedly comes from the Japanese pronunciation of the English um, word opera. Okay. But it's um, kind of a, a blend of a lot of different elements. Um, mm -hmm. So you got new uh, plots that would be taken not just from history, but from novels. Uh -huh. um, you know, from like swordsman novels or detective novels or Western movies. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, you'd have much less traditional kind of Chinese looking costumes. I mean, there's, there's, it's still all set in, right. you know, quote, unquote, ancient China. Um, but you would have the, 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 I mean, genres in, in Chinese opera are generally defined in terms of their musical repertoire and the language right. they're in. Um, so in the musical repertoire, you have a whole lot of pop songs would be added. People will sing pop songs as well as the traditional oh. repertoire. And um, yeah, so this is, um, um, well, the, the, these is, are photos of um, one of my favorite actresses, Tsai Mei Zhu, who I worked with a lot at the time. Um, and the, the red pieces of paper in the back, they're hung in the back, and that's money stapled oh. to them. And those are gifts from the fans. Great. Right. to the actress and they're sort of displayed to show kind of how popular the actress is right. uh, and the clown characters play a very big role in um in these shows in the evening it's yeah. it's one and of these characters a clown character or no or... um okay in the picture on the right 
I think the character on the left yeah. is a, probably a clown, but it, not okay. um, a kind of standard clown, just more like a right. comic version of uh, a bureaucrat. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the clown characters are really interesting because they actually wear more modern clothing. Right. I think it's kind of based on like the 1920s, so they usually wear like auto caps and shorts and right. um, and they will often, you know, they break the fourth wall all the time and they're um, constantly kind of making fun of the hero for, right. um, for basically being in this ancient world. <laughs> right. You know, so, so um, I remember like for an example, there was a one I saw where, you know, the hero is, this is a very stock scene, like the hero is going to take the imperial exams so that he can become, you know, an official. Uh, and he gets robbed on the way to the exam. And he's, you know, what is he going to do? He has no money. Uh, and the clown appears and said, I have a cell phone. Let's call your cousin in Japan. He can wire you the money. Right. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's so interesting because so many aspects of puppetry, I think in um, like uh, Indonesian puppetry, but also Sicilian marionette theater and um, traditional European puppet theater yeah. um, include those kinds of clown characters who, um, uh, who are in the present, you know, like the servant to Faust or something like that, uh, or one of the clown characters. Yeah. The Sicilian stories is utterly of the present, and even of the kind of 1920s period you're talking about. Yeah, can, it's, it's a very similar. Can we similar go on thing. to the next? So, bit sure. Yes. Yeah, so this this if I can wait a second. form this the Obela kind of started after the war, after the Japanese left. Okay, so this is actually this, the second reason that I got interested in Taiwanese opera and went to Taiwan instead of going to um, to mainland China or going to Japan or, or Indonesia. Um, is that it has a much more, um, say, lively uh, interaction with media, new media technologies. So okay. every new media technology that's come along, Guahi has, has kind of been there. So um, the picture on the, on the left is um, from a movie, Wang Bao Chuan, um, which was made... I can't remember what year. I think it was 63, but it was one of the first, if not the first, Taiwanese language films. And okay. it was a live film. And the theater troupe, it was made by this, one of the largest theater troops. They at one point had, I think, like 12 touring troops. Wow. Um, and they made a bunch of, of these movies, and it was a whole genre of Taiwanese language cinema um, in, in the 50s and 60s, in the 60s. Um, and then the the other one on the right top is uh, a radio, a, a Wahi actress performing radio, and, and there were a lot of um, you know, recordings that were sold separately. And then on the bottom is um, from the television version. Uh -huh. okay. Which started around, uh, I think, in 1962. Okay. 1962. Um, in Taiwan. In Taiwan, yeah. And that really was what, what kind of got me was television because I'd never seen anything like this. Right. On television before, they're basically filmed, you know, with the whole three camera system as though they were soap operas, but right. all of the male, you know, or the leading male roles, a lot of the minor ones are played by men, but the leading male roles are played by women whose mm. you know, body isn't disguised and, you know, they don't find their breasts or anything. It's right. obviously women, but they're playing the male roles. Right. Um, and then the characters will, you know, they'll have close ups and then they'll just burst into song. Right. Um, so, so you have this kind of weird blend of um you know the sop of, of soap opera with you know the very staginess of right. you know theater and this cross gender stuff and i was like wow this is kind of amazing because right. it's, it's you know hard to imagine anything like that or it's um, it's very different from what from i think our experience in the united states of of the content of television in our and and the relationship between older forms like opera or um, maybe, I don't know, musical theater and what we normally see on television, maybe. Yeah. Maybe we could um, uh, jump into the, the puppet theater, which has a great relationship. Would that be okay? Okay, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so, so 
after I finished the dissertation, I thought that I would do um, research on, on Taiwanese puppetry as kind of a parallel. First, because these two genres are kind of linked as like the, the national genres in Taiwan, the, the kind of two most, you know, our tradition thing. Um, and also because when I had gone to temple festivals to watch Wahi, there was uh, at bigger fe festivals, you'll often have a bunch of stages facing each other and kind of competing for the audience, the human audience, um, but also the God audience, I guess. Um, and usually you'd have the, the guahi on one side, the opera on one side, which is being performed, you know, by women. Um, and then the audience is mostly women. The fans are also like, you know, 90% women. Um, and then on the other side, you'd have puppetry and the people watching the fans would be mostly men. At, in the 90s, it was, the audience had gotten very old. It was mostly older men and little kids. And these are happening at the same time, these performances? Yeah, yeah, it's very loud. <laughs> Right. It's very confusing. It's a lot of fun. Um, Amazing. Yeah. So, so this is the um, the traditional form of uh, the Taiwanese puppetry called Budaishi or um, in Mandarin or Bodehi oh, in in Taiwanese. Okay. Um, they have these very beautiful stages. Right? Yes. And, and the puppets are about like a foot high, maybe a little less. Okay. And they're very delicate, uh, and they're, the faces are um, kind of very s similar. Like the faces look kind of like um, the makeup of of Chinese opera, of, of like Beijing opera or you know, mm -hmm. their opera. So they and the, the characters are are all divided by type in the same way mm -hmm. in both genres. So they're you know you get the division between male and female, and mm -hmm. then into military versus um, civil or literary. Um, like the whole typology of, 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 of those characters. Excuse me for yeah. interrupting you. Maybe I'll move on to the next one. Yeah. Okay, so, so like Opela developed in the 1950s after, after World War II in, um, in the opera, you got a similar development of a, a kind of more popular theater. Right. You perform both at temple festivals and also uh, moving into commercial theaters, but Kind of a lot less mm. um, commercial theaters for the puppetry, uh, but it was called Kim Gong Hee, or kind of um, you know flashing light theater. Okay. Um, and the puppets got a little bit bigger. Okay. Uh, and mainly the heads. The heads got bigger, and they had moving parts. Okay. Um, and you got a lot of special effects, dry ice, and you know the mm. puppets could like you know mm -hmm. have things that would shoot out of their palms, or their eyes would bulge out, or you know fangs coming out and things like that. They were, they're very cool. They're very, um, a lot of, you know, more monsters, but also, you know, kind of more original plots based on, on novels or movies, um, things like that. Um, and like, um, like Opela in the opera, you know, it's the genre that's considered, or was uh, at least, you know, up to until like around the, the mid 1990s, um, considered very low class. Mm. The, the, the image on the, the left, it looks, it, it looks quite similar to the image we were look, images we were looking at in the previous slide, but sort of on steroids or something, or the Las Vegas version, the, the set, set yeah. the colors of the, the set are kind of electric, and then the lighting is much more dramatic. It's, it's almost filmic. It's, it's interesting to see it. It's uh, how this seems to be like this hand puppet theater on an, on another level in a way. Yeah, um, yeah. I guess you didn't, I, you didn't get like a whole a whole stage show of the Obela, but this is it looks really similar to like Obela is just as bright and dramatic lighting. Okay. And, um, okay. And you know, loud music and and everything, but this is also you, the the temple festival version. So you're looking from the temple. Uh huh. You know, okay. The same line of sight as the gods would have um, inside the temple. So, the wife. but yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, but it's a very different feel from um, the traditional form, which is um, yeah, it's much smaller and um, more refined, and, and or considered more refined. 
and and the puppets on the right are uh, this seems to to illustrate what you were saying about the heads being larger. We have some yeah. Taiwanese hand puppet heads on display at our museum, and yeah, mm -hmm. as you say, they're they're the heads are much bigger than uh, regular uh, mainland China Budaishi heads, which are you know pretty small. And these heads, uh, the heads we're looking at, are bigger. Yeah, yeah. My sense that was is that that is those are part of a, a Taiwanese television puppetry that started in the fifties, if I'm not wrong. That may, maybe you're talking uh, sixties. Yeah. So so the um, we well, had a segue. These ones are, are definitely I'm pretty sure they're they're stage puppets. Okay. And then the Taiwan didn't really. Um, get television studios set up until 1961, I think. And then okay. immediately both Budaishi and Wahi, both the opera and the puppetry, kind of went on okay. television. Cool. Um, but it was in 1970 that it really took off. Uh, there was a puppeteer named Huang Junxiong who had been doing this kind of puppetry, the, the kind you're seeing in the slide. Um, and he kind of put it on television, but adapted it. He made the, the puppets um, a little bigger, but more proportional. Okay. Um, and he kind of started building sets that had kind of more, more planes in them so that, you know, you could have the puppets moving in, you know, more complicated things, okay. and could, you know, use the camera to do pans and things like that to get more of a sense of movement. Right. Um, and he did a series called Shi Yen Wen that just, was in, just incredibly popular. I think it, right. you know, got something like ratings of like 97%, which, I mean, there were only two other options on, on television, there were only three stations, but um, most of the people over 50 that I've talked to in Taiwan remember like running home from school because it was on at noon. Uh -huh. And okay. they would, you know, run home for lunch so they could like watch it while they were eating lunch, run back to school and talk about it with their classmates. Mm -hmm. Um, so it kind of was a defining, mm. a defining, yeah, entertainment for a whole generation. I mean, I, I guess like Sesame Street for us. In some my understanding is that uh, that there was a a twenty four hour puppet television station that that only broadcast puppet shows in in, in Taiwan as well. I guess in the sixties. No. Okay. No, I don't think so. I think you're thinking of the, the Peely puppets, which I'll get to in a minute, they started their own television station. Okay. And so, they run reruns of their television puppetry um, for I think about eight hours total a day, maybe more, maybe 16, okay. but it's not all puppetry. They also um, do other shows. But actually in, um, up until the end of martial law, which ended in 1987, um, and kind of the effects lasted a little longer than that. Um, programming in the Taiwanese language was actually res really restricted. You could only have a certain, a couple of hours a day, I think. Um, so actually, yeah, it, it, there was only the one show usually on each channel. There, mm -hmm. uh, there was, um, yeah, but the, but the Pili now does have, um, their own station. Can I move on to the next image here, and then uh, hopefully we'll d yeah. we can t we can discuss the, the these things after we stop the screen sharing too. Aha! So here, speaking of television puppetry, what are we yeah. looking at here? These three images. Okay, so so here just to show the the parallels uh, between the opera and the puppetry that they all that that they both similarly adapted to new media mm. as they came along. Um, so the one on the top, on the, on the left, is a movie hoarding um, for a puppet movie. Okay. Um, none of them, I, I don't think any of them exist or are still around. I've tried to see one, I've never seen one. Um, but they did make films shown in movie theaters of puppetry. Um, and then the, on the bottom is, a, it's a picture of a television showing the Shi Yanwen series. Uh, Hong right. Jun's, you know, that groundbreaking 1970s series. Okay. Um, and then on the right, you can see, but it's, it's, um, it's an album cover of an LP 
from um, a puppet, a television puppet series. So it's like the uh, the audio, um, the audio version of 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 a, of a puppet show that you would buy as an LP record. Yeah, play? Huh. yeah, because it had you know music and cool. Singing. Um, yeah, and when Huang Jun Chong uh, put the puppetry on television, um, he also started to write original scripts. You know, you, you started to have to started to have to use scripts, um, and they wrote original songs. Although a lot of them were set to the tunes of you know Broadway musicals, <laughs> songs from Broadway musicals, or you know, but I remember one was the theme from Bonanza. You know, they really. Had a, <laughs> One character had, you know, his theme song was the theme from the dance of the thing. Um, yeah, and then w when you got to Peely, when you got to the 1990s and, and just kind of knew the copyright regime really kind of coming in in force, then you get totally original music. And, mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like you're, like you're, some of your initial <clears throat> interests are, are in this area of, of Taiwanese opera and and then because of the nature of the performance and the temple performances, you're necessarily looking at, at Taiwanese puppetry, which is doing some parallel things. Yeah. And then we're looking at Taiwanese puppetry shifting from its, um, what I would think are the, the, the connections to mainland China, Budaishi hand puppetry mm -hmm. and into this, world of, of uh, media performance on film and television. And you're sort of taking all of this in and trying to understand how it's all an aspect of Taiwanese culture and Taiwanese identity. Is that, is that a, a, a proper estimation? Yeah, he said, well, well um, yeah, I saw them as parallel maybe the puppetry and the operas parallel mainly because um, the kind of discourse of, of Taiwanese like national identity or okay. ethnic identity um, and Taiwan as being you know separate separate culturally from the mainland um, right. sort of started in the 1970s um, and kind of came to you know became more the dominant discourse uh, by the end of the 1990s, like in 2000, the first opposition party, Taiwan, Taiwanese president was elected. And, um, so in that discourse, they had, you know, both the opera, opera and the puppetry kind of had um, these roles as kind of representing the spirit of Taiwan. Um, right. And you kind of went from a movement that was like these, these the more popular forms of the genre are, um, you know, they're, too, they're chaotic and they mix all this stuff up and we have to purify them and refine them to bring them back to what they were so that they'll represent more, you know, okay. better the spirit of Taiwan. Uh, and then you got a shift in the 1990s to, well, actually the spirit of Taiwan is this popular stuff. Um, it's actually okay. this ability to take from everywhere and create something new, this kind of bricolage um, mm -hmm. spirit that's, that's really, what's really Taiwanese about it. Um, mm -hmm. So that um, you got a kind of different, a valorization of a kind of, mm -hmm. you know, re revaluing of the lower class genre to become more representative, but, but there, but the parallel kept, going like the that those two things went together the opera and uh would i see it's interesting what you're saying because um uh we um uh we had a forum with jennifer goodlander who wrote this book about identity in south asian culture and how puppetry is uh in, in her analysis connected to ideas of national identity and cultural identity and I'm, I'm hearing you talk about something similar whereby uh, ha traditional hand puppetry and, and, and Taiwanese opera, it becomes an important way to show what Taiwanese identity is all about. I, I, it's interesting that to think of that in sort of Asian and South Asian contexts 
uh, because it makes you wonder, oh, is that the case also in, in Europe, in the US, and, and, and other places as well? Yeah, I mean, I think you get similar pairings in, you know, like in Indonesia and Japan and, mm -hmm. and India, um, where you have, um, you know, these genres of live theater and puppetry that have developed together and started at least at the beginning kind of performing the same stories. Uh, okay. The Rata and the Ramayana, right? Or, um, you know, the Kabuki, like Kabuki and, and Bunraku or, you know, Ningyo Juria. So, yeah. Um, so this is, an, you know, I think that's fairly common in, in Asia anyway. Right. Um, I think people yeah. in, in the in the West have strong stronger identities than one might think. With you know the the, the Muppets, for example, or uh, Star Wars characters, or um, you know uh, anime or cartoon characters. But I don't think we necessarily think about those characters as as examples of national identity. But yeah. Well, I don't know. Yeah, like um, like they put puppets, both the traditional puppets and Healy puppets, on like on postage stamps. Right. Have, have they ever put like Muppets on? I think stamps? I think there might yeah. be some Muppet yeah. stamps, but I'm not <laughs> sure. I'll have to investigate. You just mentioned Peely, and I wonder if we should we should next go to this video clip. Okay, well you can of... you can do the the poster, I guess, or and I can. Oh, uh, okay. Let the next I'll do that. Slide. And then um, we can show the okay. thing. I just want to kind of um, explain. Uh, Peely, um, I, I decided not to work on the traditional puppet theater, um, the stuff that's performed at temple festivals for, for a few reasons. Um, the main one being that my Taiwanese just isn't good enough. Um, you know, like the opera, it's performed in a kind of classical version of the language um, okay but with the, with the opera at least I could understand the clown characters but most of a lot of the traditional puppetry doesn't the clown characters are even that quite as understandable for me um, and also other people you know there was more written about it more people were working on it uh, and then I saw the PD puppets on on television and the PD series and the PD company was founded by two brothers who were the sons of Huang Ping Chong, the guy who did this big, you know, the most popular show ever in Taiwan in the right. 70s. Um, and they're kind of amazing. So um, I'll let you see, but they have subtitles, uh, which was <laughs> really helpful to me to have subtitles um, so that I could kind of pause and yeah. um, figure and, out what was going on. And as I und understand it from from your book, like what we're looking at and what we're going to see in the video is an ongoing series of um, heroic, uh, epic s storytelling that kind of has a relationship to more traditional Chinese epic stories. Like I, the, the one I know a little bit is journey to the west but it's also connected with manga and uh it, it's not based on you know the traditional dramaturgy but rather something else is that is that more or less on base yeah it, it, it's in a, a, a genre called wuxia which is usually translated as swordsman or knight's errant okay. um, but that has a lot of subgenres so it's this is the more like supernatural, fantastical version. Okay. So all the, you know, most of the characters have supernatural powers. Um, and um, it's often said that like in the West, speculative fiction means science fiction, but in China, speculative fiction is, is set in the past. Interesting. In way, so like fantasy worlds tend to be set in the past rather than the future or something somewhere else. So um, Fascinating. So Wuxia is kind of, a, you can think of it as, as kind of more in some ways like science fiction than, or fantasy, you know, okay. sci-fi fantasy kind of genre. And it draws in, um, yeah, character types and, or, you know, models for characters and 
designs and worlds and music from all over, you know, mm -hmm. everywhere from, um, okay. you know, Indonesian gamelan music to, you know, robots and uh, and rice vamp and rice style vampires. There's a whole series mm -hmm. featuring, you know, the world, this world of and rice kind of vampires that dress like 18th century French courtiers, but also mm -hmm. played the saxophone who, you know, suddenly showed up in the middle of ancient China. Right. Um, and that, and that, that, a fascinating thing about this for me is that the way that this form is open to combination, all sorts of combinations that are not simply, you know, Taiwanese and Chinese and, and not even China, you know, connecting to Japan, but as you pointed out, Indonesia or and rice, or it's like all different types of, of cultural uh, uh, representations can find a place in this form. Yeah, and they, they keep just adding, um, like it, it goes in series and each series is, you know, maybe 20 episodes long, depending right. on the area a lot. Um, but each series kind of ends with a cliffhanger where the main so one plot is kind of completed and then you get a cliffhanger that's the start of the next plot and then the next series. Right. So it's actually a, a continuous series that's, yeah. a few years ago they had their 30th anniversary. So like it's, right. series has been going and going right. for, yeah, over 30 years, well over 30 years. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's in, in Western theater, we, um, you know, traditional Western theater, when you teach drama and stuff you're talking a lot about in western contexts uh tragedy and comedy as as aristotle defines it and then epic the the epic the nature of epic is not something that's that's often um been a, been a part of of what we think of as drama but um but soap operas are epics and and puppetry so much of puppet dramaturgy is related to epic structure like i think what the peely series you just talked about so interestingly so yeah. i wonder if we should go to this um maybe. okay yeah we should, we should give people an idea of, of what it's like i don't want to say too much because i just want to let it blow people away if i get to okay. <laughs> Oh, Shishi Hold Thanks. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. That was very exciting. Yes. And, and um, 
like thinking of that where, would be the highlight of an episode. <laughs> sorry. So that would be the highlight of one episode. Okay, very okay. exciting. Yeah. And I mean, in, in terms of puppetry, it's uh, it's super interesting. We were talking about you know traditional Budaishi Chinese hand puppetry, Taiwanese versions. The heads get bigger. But this, this, this is, um, I think, w with some uh, special effects, but basically hand puppet performance, but it's on a different scale or a different, uh, different level of, of um, costume and movement than, and, and, and production value than what we've seen. So God, what yeah. are we looking at here? Okay, well, the, the puppets, I mean, it, it's, Peely has developed this style that's quite different from the, um, from the, you know, their father's series in the, in the 70s. Um, so the puppets have gotten much bigger and have a lot more articulated parts. They can, like, even close their hands and they have, you know, eyes that open and close and mouths, lips that open and close. Um, and now they're actually huge. They're like, I don't know, like, two and a half, three feet tall, uh -huh. maybe? They're, they're quite big, and um, they're hand and rod puppets. Okay. So um, the head and the left, yeah, the head and the right hand are done by hands, and then okay. the- Okay, like traditional. Yeah, and then the left arm is done with a rod. Attached. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, and then sometimes they have two puppeteers when they want to do things with the legs. Okay. Interesting. Legs, legs are jointed now and things. So it is. Yeah, you could probably tell. It's, it's a combination. There's um, a you know puppet just traditional puppeteering, although it's not mm -hmm. traditional Buddhist style because those are mm -hmm. you know so small. Um, but they've developed their own you know new style of puppeteering. You know, they've kind of invented this, you know, combo rod hand puppets. Um, and so they, they film those, but um, and sometimes they'll like throw them up in the air and right. you know, flip and things like that. Uh, a lot's done with editing. The camera's a lot more mobile in, um, I think it was 2000, 2001. They made a, a movie and they bought digital cameras to make the movie. And then they kept the digital cameras so they can do a lot more editing and the cameras are, are more mobile. Mm -hmm. So they use several cameras um, and they'll have them move around and then the editor in the booth will be like cutting um, and editing as they're, while they're performing. Mm -hmm. um, like the traditional form and like Wang Junxiong, one of the things that has stayed the same, I mean the puppets have changed a lot and how the puppets are performed. Uh, but one thing that stayed the same is that one voice actor does all of the voices. That's interesting. And it's um, one of the, the brothers, the Huang brothers. Mm -hmm. um, Huang Wenzi, I think he goes, I think his English name is Victor. Um, and he voices all of the characters. And it's been, you know, 30 years, there's thousands of characters. Mm -hmm. um, and they have to be distinct. So all of, at least the main characters have very distinct voices. And he does the, um, both the male and the female. Voices. Okay, so that we're getting back to one of your interests with the Taiwanese opera was this yeah. cross-gender performance that happened so much in puppetry. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the interesting things um, that I found was was that actually it's not really thought of that way. He's right. not thought of as, as as like a cross-gender performer. Right. Um, yeah. So so I was going to say is I started off with this idea that these were parallel forms. Um, and that uh, puppetry might have the same kind of relationship to mas Taiwanese masculinity or masculine identity okay. that, um, that Guai he had with, with you know, women and their sense of gender. Um, and I thought that, you know, since for the traditional form, most of the, the audience is men, um, that that would be true of PV too. Okay. And um, kind of all of these things that I, assumed coming from my performance studies, you know, okay. performance background, um, a lot, a lot turned out to be wrong. Uh, so first of all, the audience was not mostly male. Okay. Uh, 
the audience, I mean, I did some surveys to find out the audience that kind of just watches, if you just, you know, do a survey of who rents the videos or, you know, it used to be rental, now it's streaming, but, you know, who, who watches uh, PD, it's about 50-50, maybe a little bit more men. Okay. So men are a slight majority there, the, the kind of what you call the passive audience. But if you go to the fans, um, right. the active fans, the, the, the ones who, you know, form fan clubs and right. participate in activities, um, you know, write fan fiction about the characters, and I'll, I'll go over that a little bit. But that's mostly women, like at least right. 80 women at all the fan act, you know, um, fan activities that I've been to. So, so I was wrong there. I thought I was going to be like um, interviewing mostly middle-aged or older men, and I wound up interviewing mostly young women. And and um, what do you make of that? What does that what does that mean? What does how does that reflect Taiwanese culture? Um, yeah, I'm not. Well, I think it, it's more a ref well, yeah. I guess it is Taiwanese culture, but it, it's. Um, I think that that is because of the way that Taiwan has adapted the fan culture of manga and anime from Japan. And because they see Pili, the televised puppetry, as animation rather than as a kind of performance. So, so the young people, they're watching it on TV and in part because it's adapted to television in this way that's right. um, much more um, making a lot more use of, of the affordances of the tele of television as a medium than mm -hmm. you usually get, mm -hmm. right? So I think in, in, in Indonesia, like, you know, Wine Coolit or Wine Gold, they just put a camera, like, in right. front of the screen, right? And then they just um, put it on television or a lot of faking operas like that, right? Like, it's just, they just film a stage performance. And it's really sophisticated. You'll get different camera angles from different parts of the theater, but basically it's just a film. This is not that, right? You can, you can see it's, it's television. Right. It's not right. anything right. else. You know, I mean, so in, in some ways this is like the, the leap from, I don't know, like to the Muppets, right? Where you have whole different, you know, from, yeah. Um, where, where they were really using the, the television medium. Right. Um, but in what's interesting is, yeah, go ahead. In terms of, of manga, um, what were you were you thinking that the audience for manga, thinking about the gendered audiences for 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 this these performances, like manga and anime performances, have a large female are, are largely female or have a significant female uh, contingent? Is that the connection? Oh. Well, it's, it's interesting because it, it depends on the genre. So because this is Ushia and most of the characters are male, right? Um, it works kind of like um, a lot of genres, like a samurai or, or, or sports manga or anything where um, you would have a similar thing in Taiwan where the readership, or what, what are called boys manga, right? right. Uh, um, the readership would be mixed and maybe mostly men, but the fans, a lot of the fans would be women who will be fujoshi or funu in English, which means um, one of their main interests is in um, taking the characters kind of out of the context of the original narratives and writing their own fiction about them. Yeah. Um, particularly fiction in which the male characters are in love or sexual relationship and or sexual relations with each other. Right. Okay, so Wait, they write a lot of boys love fan fiction. Boys love, right. Which is, yeah. a, which as I understand it of, from, your, from your book, um, is, a, is, a, is part of the Japanese uh, world of, of manga and anime and and then shifts or s now is somehow part of, of the the Peely stories yeah so so it's like the whole structure of of Japanese manga anime fandom a lot of it's just come directly um, directly to Taiwan I mean 
Okay. At some point, like now, it's just as Taiwanese as mm -hmm. as it is Japanese. I would say because it's been around so long, and there are you know kind of local adaptations. But that that is one part is the the big um, the kinds of activities that bands do and the the dominance of BL uh, boys love in kind of the recreation of the characters in fan fiction and fan art. Do Taiwanese audiences see the Peely shows as uh, kind of live or, or um, I want to say live action uh, puppet performance of manga or are Taiwanese audiences seeing Peely performances as a development and continuation of Budai Shi? You know what I mean? Because it looks like manga, yeah. but the technique is coming from Bu Dai Shi, traditional Chinese hand puppetry. Yeah, I would say both. I think what they think of it is um, more like a, a kind of three-dimensional version okay. of anime. Um, I mean, dimensions get used in, in a special way and kind of manga anime fandom so that 2D refers to the kind of diegetic world of the the world of manga and anime where 3D means like real life and then you get 2.5D which is some blend of the two. Um, I don't know if people have talked about Peely as 2.5D probably but it, it's kind of like this kind of in there. So the, the um, uh, Huang Changhua, the, the one of the brothers who's like the, the the main script, script writer and now script super, supervisor um, and the CEO of the Peely company. He often describes the Peely series as um, between anime, meaning like, okay, anime, and Budaishi. What, could, hold on a second. Like, could you explain uh, to me more clearly the, di the difference between 2D and 2.5D, and I guess 3D is the <laughs> is the other part of okay. that. Yeah. So um, in the the kind of Japanese manga and anime subculture, I guess of the the fandoms, um, right. you'll often hear the terms 2D and 3D, and um, so 2D refers to basically manga and anime, right? Because they're you know, like, 2D, they're on so screen, or they're like in comic books, books or yeah, and books you read, and also f things you watch on the screen that are like 2, 2D animation. Yeah, um, but it's not that literal, it's referring more to that kind of fantasy world. Okay. What's well, yes, 2.5, 2.5D? Yeah, 3. Point, yeah, 3D is, is real life. Uh, and 2.5, 2.5, um, I think the most common use for it is per, like um, performances of like stage cosplay. Okay, So good. where people will like, you'll have live actors playing the characters. Okay, good. Right. Um, or things, um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are sort of different ways that you can blend the 2D and 3D. That, that's kind of one of them. Um, Maybe that's a cue to, to look at our next images, which are about fandom and cosplay. Should we, can we do that? Sure, yeah. Okay, do, are you seeing this image? of the, yeah. what are we looking at here? Okay, so this is a fan convention, a puppet fan convention. So um, originally had, um, when uh, manga and anime uh, fan cons started um, okay. in Taiwan, and they're based on uh, the comic hit, the, the kind of market of amateur fan fiction um, and fan art in Tokyo mm -hmm. and they started doing them very soon after the one started in Tokyo in, in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just basically a big, um, they're usually held in, in um, a gym or a big, you know, okay. 
some big venue. Um, and these are tables set up and where different individuals or groups are selling um, manga that they've written or original short stories or original art based on the characters, mm. uh, you know, featuring the characters. Um, and now it's developed, um, it's such a big subculture that it's kind of split and they have what are called onlys, which are conventions dedicated to just one genre or just okay. one series. So this is a budaishi or a bodehi only. So there's mm. um, right now, th like I think four or maybe five puppetry series that mm. were included. Pili's one. Um, there's another one called Jingguang, and then there was Thunderbolt Fantasy that I, I write about. Right. In the book. So fans of all of those series um, come here. And so I don't know if you can see, like on the tables, they've got their, their art spread out. There are some cosplayers, and a lot of them have their puppets on display. So those are puppets that they've, that they've bought, but they might have um, made some, you know, okay. of their their own new costumes for them or just you know, have them on display posed in, in, in terms in of the pup in terms of the puppets are are those puppet are people selling puppets buying and selling puppets which seem to be versions of the of what we saw in the video the, the sort of larger size uh, hand and rod puppets um, no because the Peely company kind of um, crack down on the sale of okay. puppets that, that they did not. So they're sell so you have to kind of buy them through the Peely company. I mean I okay. think they're I think you probably could, you know, buy buy them used, do the kind of eBay thing, but they don't sell them here. Here mm -hmm. they're just um, at these these events they're just um, for display and the display is also kind of a form of fan fiction in some mm -hmm. ways. It's like creating little narrative scenes, little dioramas. So maybe, can I go on to the next image in terms of fan culture? These are literally fans. <laughs> yes, it's a fan fan. That's one of the reasons I like is, it. Is um, this two sides of the same fan? Yeah, this is two sides of the same fan. And I, I just put this in because I, I didn't get to put this image in the book and I, I quite like it, but it, it's an aspect of, it's kind of got a lot of aspects of fan culture. So you get the BL, these are two male characters. Okay. Who are, I can't remember who these characters are. They're probably either, you know, comrades or enemies um, in, in the original series. Um, and here, you know, they're lovers. And then you also get this, um, one of the things that, that fans like to do is just to reproduce the characters in as many different styles, um, you know, and, and different and genres as you can. So okay. on one side, you're getting this kind of um, more classically romantic BL form, and, and then you're getting what's called the Cuban, or the, the cute version. With the big eyes. With the big eyes, yeah. Interesting. It's interesting to see the difference between those two styles with the same characters on, on, on two sides of the same fan. Right? Yeah, yeah, cool. I like that. <laughs> it's like the Fascinating. Sexy cute. cute, yeah. Also an object performance, one could say. Maybe I'll yeah. move on to the to the next one, which you were referring earlier to fans. Um, this is like cosp. Well, it is cosplay. It looks it's like cosplay, it's. Yeah. So here yeah. we, we these are. Uh, I recognize the uh, the character on the left uh, with the headdress as appearing in the yes. video we just saw. So, what's happening here? Um, okay. Well, these are different characters and they're just posing for me to take right. a picture this is um, one of the things but this is um, they're members of a troupe that actually now has become quite professional and they actually have a contract with the Peely company and do, you know promotional events and okay. club events and things like that um, but I wanted to show you some cosplay first because it looks um, in many ways is more with the female characters but it, it looks a lot like um, Wahi, like the opera performers, right? The costumes right. are ancient Chinese costumes and they're sort of fantastic and glittery. Right. Um, and in some ways it, it looks the same. And so when I started doing research with the, the Peely fans, um, one of the reasons I sort of started focusing on the difference between animation and performance as opposed to what they have in common um, is that I started asking them the same questions that I had asked like opera fans um or opera actresses you know and i would 
and like I would ask them, you know, okay, what do you, how do you get into character? Um, and the whole idea of getting into character like made no sense to them. Like they right. just didn't understand what I was asking. Um, the actresses didn't really have a problem with that. I mean, they're not, you know, method actors. They're not like right. naturalistic or psychologically realist at all. Right. But they kind of understand the idea of like getting into a character, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, acquiring the habitus of the character and kind of becoming right. the character. Um, and like Pili cosplayers and manga and anime cosplayers also just um, in Taiwan just didn't have that. They didn't think of the relationship between right. themselves and the character in that way. So mm. um, like there, there was an American show, I think on the sci-fi channel called like, uh, Heroes of Cosplay, I think it was okay. called. It, it basically followed American cosplayers, like semi-professional cosplayers around. Okay. To, to conventions where they were competing. Um, and that showed in Taiwan. And the American cosplayers were were very much about like, I want to become the character, you know, I'm right. the character real. Um, and Taiwanese cosplayers would watch that and go, that is so weird. Huh, interesting. <laughs> like they just were like Americans, you know, who knows? Right. Americans, they're just so strange. Right. So so um I remember, and I, I couldn't put it in the book because I, I couldn't find the field notes that I, where I'd written it down. But I do remember somebody saying to me when I asked her, like, "Well, how do you feel when you put on the costume?" You know, how do you, and and um, she said, "I feel like the character is is beside me." Interesting. The character is with me, which is a very different thing, right? From right. feeling like you 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 are the character. Hmm. Um, Maybe it's yeah, more so, like puppetry in a way where you feel the characters beside you instead of something you're inhabiting. But yeah, I interrupted yeah, you. So, so it is much more of a kind of animatorly, mm -hmm. <laughs> like an animatorly mm -hmm. view of what bodily performance is. Right? Like they're kind of, it's like the body becomes their puppet. Thinking of the puppets, maybe, maybe I could go on to the next image, if I can, okay. of... Uh, and this is fans. Uh, well, we're looking at two two different and somewhat related images. Am I correct? Yeah. Um, so this is from from part of the book where I talk about um, how uh, Taiwanese folk religion, like uh, folk Taoism, how ideas about um, right. the figurine, basically the human, you know, the anthropomorphic figurine have. Right influence popular culture um, and kind of show up in popular culture in Taiwan. So the image on the right is the inside of a temple. So you okay. can see you've got the same god uh, represented in several icons. I think there's four of them that are the same god the, with the black face and the beard. Um, and then there's kind of some other gods who are kind of more minor gods who are also okay. kind of in there, but you you often get very like all these different versions and different sizes of the same god on altars, as well as you know with other gods. And this is actually this is a toy collector, not a Pili collector. Um, on the left. On the left, the collection of a Pili collector, but it's organized in very much the same way, right? You have the same as right. favorite character, and you've got like all these different versions, um, right? You know, different sizes and the cute version and this. You know the not cute version, and, mm -hmm. um, and then other characters that kind of go with, and then some random characters that are from completely different series. Like, um, but also with you know the the kind of most important character, the one that he's got the most of, like uh, given you know prominence of place on the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so, so fasc fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. It's so fascinating that. Um, it seems to me you're seeing the 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 parallels in terms of objects and structure and the creation of these altars, which by the way reminds me of, of treatments of like Yoruba altars in Cuba or mm -hmm. um, some of my relatives' uh, arrangements of of uh, 
anime figures, but is there any crossover at all with like a, the traditional god that you find in the right hand image? Would that ever appear in, in something like the, le the altar on the left hand side? Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, but well, you would not have an actual um, shen xiang, they're called shen, the images of the god, the statue right. of the um, that had a god inside. Okay. Um, so, so kind of what they have uh, placed in that situation, but you might have like an antique, um, an antique one of these statues, a statue of a god that the god had left, um, might be displayed with you know more modern toys, and so probably not with the toys, like at a different thing. Um, and you do have. Um, there are some, for instance, some of the Pili characters are um, are bodhisattvas or okay. like deities, like not um, not known deities, but they're you know kind of in, invented bodhisattvas because bodhisattvas can you know any potentially if everyone can become a bodhisattva after enough lives, right? So so you have these characters that are sort of divine, and actually I think some of them our gods are talked about as, as okay. being gods, but they're not Chinese. Mm. Um, they're like Japanese gods or something. So, or Buddhist but you do have or these, Hindu gods. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think they have Hindu gods. They've had some like Tibetan looking kind of ones. Um, they were Thai, you know, they've got like a, the four-faced, who do they had a four-faced demon kind mm. of guy who looked sort of like that. But, um, but they do have some characters that are within the world of Pili, within the diegetic world, they're, they're bodhisattvas. Um, and I have talked to fans who say that um, they will be much more careful about where they display those puppets, if they have copies of those puppets, than, than with the other ones. Right. Um, and, and some of them will actually, you know, treat them a little bit like, like icons, the light incense or, you know, them. Um, but the main thing I see is, is more a parallel in terms of the relationship between the character or, or you know, the virtual personality uh, and the material object. Um, so that you have, whether it's a god or a manga anime character or a Peely character, like the character okay has its own reality and lives okay. its, in its own world. But you okay. can interact with it through a material object, which um, people might okay. think of as, you know, Great. being in, like inhabited by that, by that character. It's kind of a, a home mm -hmm. that the character can come in. Well, well with the icons, the, the god can come and go. But you know, it's invited into, once it's invited into the icon, it, it should stay there although uh -huh. you know sometimes you, you if you pray to the icon and you don't right. feel like you're getting a response um but sometimes it's because the god inside had to do had to run an errand you know had to, right. had to make a report or something and then was temporarily left yeah. um and you can come back later um but it but it's it's more that the the material object is kind of is a materialization of the character, but is not the same as the character. Mm. Great. So, huh? Th that's fascinating. That the these two parallel means of dealing through objects with other other realms in in a way, and and one has the older one has this sort of religious function, and the other the other one has a less of a religious function, but maybe it's doing similar things to the people who are creating these these altars yeah i mean people treat them in some ways that are similar to um to how they treat um the statues of the gods so um i mean they don't usually light incense unless like <laughs> it's, it's a puppet of a, of a god and they don't treat them ritually but they do for instance talk to them um, right sometimes cool. and, yeah and display them in in, uh, in this way that's kind of similar I mean, it's interesting when i was um when i was working on the opera the opera actresses like i said they do do this ritual at the beginning of the show um 
when they're performing in temple festivals and when they're you know, to present the offering. Uh -huh. And they are performed, you know, in this temple festival context. And, um, you know, scholars often talk about, you know, there's this ritual context for, for the Taiwanese opera. But I basically um, am not particularly interested myself in religion. And I kind of managed to avoid it because when I was working on the opera, because to the fans, um, the religious context was not what they were there for. Right. It didn't matter. So, and I was more interested in the fans. Like, often they didn't even know what, what, mm. who's, which God's birthday it was. They didn't care. Right. They would go, I mean, you know, you would go and you would bye bye. You would, you know, say hello to the God, kind of um, be polite. But, but like, they wouldn't, they didn't think of anything that they were doing and watching or that the performers were doing on stage right. as being religious. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started to work on the puppetry, I, it, it kind of just like hit me in the face. Like I couldn't avoid it. And it wasn't because there was this ritual context. Um, it was because the language um, that the fans used, they used religious language to talk about the puppets a lot. Okay. Um, and like I said, those, these practices had these sort of really obvious parallels in, in um, religious practice. Um, so the main one, um, the main thing that got me started was that they make a distinction between what they call Bensun and um, Fenshen, uh, or the, the original icon, the okay. original statue, right. the copy. Right. right? Um, and that's from religious discourse and the original, okay. the original God, God statue is like the parent statue and right. incense is taken from that statue's burner to put inside of the copy, you know, of that okay. God right. to invite the God in. Right. Sure. Right. Yeah. And so you have like, there's this sort of hierarchy of gods based on how many generations, you know, mm. away they are from, from the Benzun. And for the, the Peely fans, the Benzun are the ones that appeared in the original videos. Right. Right. Okay. And, and they don't use the term function anymore, but like all the other ones are kind of copies. And they do uh, a similar thing. So you can actually go to the next slide, um, which is um, they will bring their copies of the character. Right. Some of these are, most of these are toys. That mm -hmm. uh, and when the Benzun comes out, this is a puppeteer holding, performing with one of the Benzun puppets. The original puppet. At, at a fan convention. Yeah. Yeah. The original puppet. So he's, so this is the highlight of most fan activities where they invite the right. puppeteer to come and from the studio to come and kind of show off the Benzun mm -hmm. and, and um, you know, bring it to life. And they will hold up their Mm -hmm. and send their copies of their, right. their, their, so, toys, their puppets so, to see that one. And you can shake hands with the things on them. So the, the, person, uh, the, per, the audience person is holding up a puppet that it seems to me is like the sort of cute version of the original puppet that the yes. puppeteer is performing. Yeah. So you have yeah. that cute The one person. that's most visible is actually the same character. Right. Um, yes, it's a, a, a cute version. And so it's important that your puppet, like the audio, the fan is holding up that puppet, not even really not performing that puppet, but wanting her cute version of that character to see the actual version of the character, which is the, which is the puppet being performed by the professional puppeteer. Yeah. And then so the, in Taiwan temples, there's an annual ritual where all of the, the, well, at least with the goddess Matsu, where, where the child, you know, the fenchen, the the copied copies of okay. the of the of the original that have that that one's incense in them, will go to visit. Um, you know, they'll they'll go in a procession to visit the benzun. Sure. Yeah. So it, it, it's sort of a a similar thing. They'll make you know, and fans will bring their puppets to the Pili studio to see the, the Benzun. And, um, I, I really appreciate the way that you're thinking about, uh, you're, and that you're able to think about these, these connections between 
what puppeteers often think of as the, you know, the, the classic traditional art forms of puppetry like Wu Daishi or Potehi in China and Taiwan and, the, and their connections to ritual and religion and the way that with something like the Pili International series and fan culture and cosplay, those kind of mainstream, very important puppet traditions are being transformed and recontextualized not only by media, but also thinking of global culture and uh, manga and anime, as you pointed out, transformed into something, something else that, that as you, you just pointed out, maintains connections with the older forms, but is also totally 21st century. That's, I find that super fascinating about your yeah. work. Thank you. Well, well, yeah, I, I have to just to get back to the idea of like animation and its difference from performance. Um, then I think like performance and animation as these kind of complementary models of what it means to be like a human and in culture, right? And one is focused on creating identity and you know focused on um, internalizing roles and, and embodying them. Uh, and animation is more focused on you know the relationship between the human and the environment and like right. project outwards as opposed to taking in. Um, but you know, I wanted to see those as kind of these very general models, but both of them um, kind of sp spread out from specific. You know, they both kind of work as metaphor, right? So, like performance with Goffman, it's like what we do when we perform the self is we're, we're doing what actors do, but in this less conscious and daily right. way. Um, and I think there's a lot of what we do as, you know, people in society. Um, that's a lot like puppeteering, where we're like, you could use puppeteering as the metaphor, but in both cases, like what the actual, you know, specifics of the cultural context and the genres that are being performed are going to affect how that metaphor works for you, right? Um, right. Yeah, so I was saying like, like with Goffman, um, I remember finding a quote from a friend of Goffman's who was like, oh, he was obsessed with television. You couldn't get him to stop watching, right? So I think that Goffman's idea of what acting is comes from this, you know, early like 40s, 50s television shows in which um, was basically like television adapting vaudeville. Um, so okay. you have these actors playing actors, playing actor, you know, right. acting a lot of comedy, like, you know, Burns and Allen and Lucille mm -hmm. Ball. And it was this particular, very self-referential style of mm -hmm. acting. Um, mm -hmm. And then once that genre and that style of acting kind of went out of style and got replaced with a more naturalistic, more like psycho psychological actor right. studio kind of acting, Goffman started to look really cynical. Like <laughs> people started to read Goffman. Uh, okay. as um, and so I think, you know, you, you have, similar things with what I call modes of animation, where in different cultural contexts, different genres of, you know, like animation as entertainment um, or as ritual will get seen as being similar, as being connected to, you know, like science, you know, certain other practices of, um, you know, economic activity or social activity or whatever, based on kind of certain characteristics that hold them together, but those are gonna be very, so that's, you get what I call a mode of animation, but that'll be really different depending on like where you are and what historical resources people have to draw on. Sure. The way, uh, when you were describing uh, or defining animation a moment ago um, and its difference from performance, uh, you talked about the way it in it's engaged with or focused on the outside world, and it makes me think of oh well, that's what puppetry is. We're you know we're taking objects, the outside world, and animating it, and it's kind of part of um, uh, what Jane Jane Bennett and others in, in Jane Bennett in her book Vibrant Matter talk about in terms of humans and and the natural world or the outside world and this animation. Of, of of the outside world. So I, 
it, it's interesting for me to think about how you're you're looking deeply at Taiwanese um, animation and making these connections that are useful for you know for for our own our own worlds. Um, I I wanted to ask you uh, because we don't have that much time left. But your your current research, you you mentioned that your current or like this maybe this is a while ago when you wrote this, but you're looking at um, the expansion of art, toy, and local comic scenes in East and Southeast Asia, um, which seems kind of related to what we're, we've been talking about. But could you uh, could you could you elaborate a little bit more about what you're doing now? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm still working on that, on both of those things, and it kind of expanded. Um, basically, through Peely, I started um, finding out, because Peely makes a lot of little cute toys. You know, some of their fun are these, are these cute little toys. Um, and I found that, you know, fans were collecting them. And then through that, I think, I can't remember why I went, but I went, somebody told me, one of the fans, um, told me about the Taipei Toy Festival, which um, I think I started on the third one. Uh, and it has, was until very recently, like the largest art toy festival in, in Asia, um, maybe in, in the world, I don't know. Um, but I found this whole scene, um, which is sort of distinct from Pili, but Pili sort of participates in it, Puppet, puppeteers participate, and other puppeteers actually, in, the one in Thailand, they often have puppeteers participating. Um, so it's this world of, of like mostly visual artists, designers, um, graphic designers, sculptors, illustrators, who will create original character toys okay. and um, usually produce them in limited editions or you know some of them cheaper and, and kind of more mass produced um, and sell them to collectors. And it's... Um, it's another subculture, um, one that requires um, a lot more money <laughs> than, um, than manga and anime. Um, but yeah, I've been interest, interested in seeing how it expands because it kind of started, at least according to most histories, in Hong Kong and Tokyo in 1999, like kind of simultaneously in those two places with these two different designers. Okay. Um, and it really started expanding and now there are these annual conventions all over all over the Pacific Rim basically right um, yeah the one in the big one in the US is in um, it used to be in San Diego and I think it's in Anaheim now okay um, there's one in New York there's mm. one in big one in Seoul and um, mm. Beijing and Shanghai mm -hmm. and yeah they're, they're kind of all over and I've been going to a lot of them and interviewing the designers and it's very interesting because they're very um again it's like a, a completely different relationship between you know the character and the creator um than mm. you get with puppets uh so yeah. in some ways they're they're not really characters or they're they're just potential characters sure um, yeah my my son and and my nieces and nephews um I, you know, I noticed a, a number of years ago an interest in in um, art toys, and which, which, as I understood it and understand it, you know, in have a consciously Asian context. It's like this is an art form, or this is a performance form, or that that's that has very strong Asian connections, but also there's a lot of American artists who are involved in art toy creation. Uh, so I, it, it's interesting to me because, um, you know, a lot of us in the puppet world are, are super interested in Asian culture because Asian puppetry is so st strong, but to have this sense of people in my family who aren't puppeteers, who aren't interested in performance studies and ethnography necessarily, the fact that they're totally interested in, in something that's by definition an Asian form with these art toys, that's super fascinating to me. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess it is kind of de facto Asian and I think it got taken up that that way, I mean, it's it's quite global now. I think the more has been kind of around the Pacific Rim because the kind of center is more 
like West Coast, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of Asian American um, artists too. But there's you know artists in Australia. There's some famous ones in Australia, and Germany, and whatever. Mm -hmm. but because yeah, the artists that started it were um, from Hong Kong and and, and Tokyo. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting because. Um, you know, they very much, they, they separate themselves from the world of like the franchise, right? So okay. they, they want to make, you know, toys that are the kind of, uh, a lot of the designers say they want to make toys that are the kind of toys that they wanted to play with, but, you know, they were too poor when they were growing up and they couldn't afford toys and now they have enough money so they can collect toys, but they can also right. like make their ideal toy and then, you know, if other people like it, they can make more of them and, and you know. Okay. Um, sell them. So it, it's kind of interesting because, yeah, they're they're kind of divided. Some of them are, are you know, they're they treat them more as art and more for mm -hmm. display and collection display. Mm -hmm. And for some people, it's like, no, it's a toy. You got to play with it. Right. Um, sure. Yeah. So it's it's an interesting interesting thing. Yeah. yeah, fascinating. And I I look forward to to more of your insights about that. We sort of got to the end of our time period here. So I'd like to thank you, Terry, for sharing your uh, perceptions, your, your insights into uh, the, this, for me, really amazing and fascinating world of, of, of Taiwanese performance or animation, as, as you point out. Um, I want to uh, say for people who might be watching this when we uh, live or stream it at four o'clock on uh, Thursday, July 23rd. Um, I think I'll try to be there as this is unrolling and, and uh, offer comments. I think we might be, maybe we can post some uh, links to different aspects of, of our talk here that you can take a look at. And um, Terry, oh, excuse me, Terry has, Terry Silvio, Terry mentioned that she'd be happy to respond to comments and, and questions over the next couple of days. Uh, the, this, this presentation will be available on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel, like the other forums. And um, as a sort of peroration, um, I, I wanted to welcome people watching this to take a look at other Ballard Institute online programming, including puppet workshops tomorrow, Friday, July 24th. Um, Elise Van Ness will be doing a fish puppet workshop. And next Wednesday, we offer these uh, Wednesdays and Fridays. We're taking a vacation, summer vacation. So we at, it asks you to take a look at some of our pre, uh, already recorded workshops. And Friday, July 31st, already the end of July, Elise is going to do a workshop on, on edible puppets. The, the next uh, forum will be um, Thursday, the 30th of, of July, and that will be with uh, Steve Tillis, who, who, who's written about the aesthetics of the puppet. And you can go to our Facebook page to see the rest of these. Um, oh, uh, <laughs> lest I forget, um, if you, if viewers would like to make a donation to the Ballard Institute to help us do more of this programming, please feel free to, we will post the link to the, the donation. So Terry, I want to thank you for staying up late and thank my colleague, Emily Wicks for getting up early. Uh, I really appreciate speaking with you despite this this distance and um, I hope we might be able to welcome you to the Ballad Institute at some time but thank you for being part of this. Too. Well thank you and I'm just really really happy <laughs> that you're interested and I really want to hear what puppeteers okay. think. Um, yeah and I'm sorry I'll be hopefully asleep when, <laughs> when this is showing, but I, I will, you know, read the comments and try and respond. And I'm just really grateful for this opportunity okay. to be such good company. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And thanks again to Emily Wicks for doing the tech aspects of this. Yes. And thanks everyone Thank for watching. Thanks. Goodbye. Yeah.